everyone, and thank you for joining us for our June 2023 FCI live series. This is day two, and we are here for Hard Truths and dif Difficult Paths, a Rac Racial Systems of Oppression with Patrice Lockhart-Anthony from Black Label Consulting and Coaching, and we're going to get that started in just a minute. First, real quick, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. Please do mute. Uh, make sure you're not uh, having your sound on so we don't hear you speaking or other weird background noises because we are recording and that will affect our quality, uh, sound quality issues. And this is the number one question we get asked every time we open one of these sessions. All of these sessions are being recorded, absolutely. There will be video from them. And if you've registered for any of our classes, you will be getting an email on the afternoon of Monday, July 3rd, with the link to where you can find all the videos from the series. With that said, which real quick shout out, uh, FCI Live's champion sponsor for our uh, 2023 series is National Co-op Grocers. Thank you to them for making this series possible. All right. So without further ado, I am going to turn our conversation over to Patrice Lockhart-Anthony, the principal of Black Label Consulting and Coaching. And thank you so much for being here, Patrice. Thank you, JQ. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Show me some hands or something. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Put it in the chat. Quiet and group tonight. Okay, actually, I want to say to everyone, before I begin, uh, uh, officially begin, please use the chat uh, and to say anything that you need and want to say, whether it's to remind yourself or an exclamation uh, or saying it to each other, to affirm, reaffirm, to disagree. I can handle disagreement. I've had a lot of it in my life, <laughs> so I can handle disagreement. Um, and while I would love to read what you have written, it is not for me. I want you to write while you listen so that you can track what you are thinking as I am speaking, okay? So feel free, you guys, you guys also might wanna introduce yourselves uh, in the in the chat as well. Uh, if you come to Up and Coming, you'll actually have breakout sessions and we'll have a chance to speak to each other <laughs> in person. Um, so here we go. Uh, as JQ said, my name is Patrice Lockhart-Anthony. Did you see how I just modulated my voice because now I'm going into presenter mode? <laughs> I am Patrice Lockhart-Anthony. Uh, I own Black Label Consulting and Coaching. And every bit of work I do is grounded in equity and justice, uh, primarily for my people. And by my people, I mean Black people, African-American people. Uh, after that, it is in favor of the global majority, that is people of color. Uh, and I also do sessions like this, that uh, are for uh, white people, particularly white Americans, because we are all members of the beloved community and it's time that we started acting that way and doing the work. And there is no better place for that to begin than in the cooperative movement, particularly the food co-op movement, because I gotta tell you, there's not a damn thing that's gonna happen without us feeding our brains, our spirits, our souls. Uh, that nutrition is what helps our brain do the work that we need to do and allows our bodies to function in ways that get us going. All right, here's the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do. I want you all to close your eyes. Wherever you are, unless you need to protect yourself in some way, Wherever you are, close your eyes, take a deep breath in, as deep as you can. When you get there, hold it for a count of five, exhale for four counts.
Now do it one more time for me. Okay. Open your eyes. We're gonna dive deep. Uh, JQ, can I have the next slide, please? Our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our soul as well as a quantitative change in our lives. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I can't tell you how important that is for me in my work and hopefully for all of our work going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Love and respect equals truth. If you truly love someone and you respect their personhood and you respect and love your own personhood, truth should not be something to fear. Truth is something to embrace. Truth is something to share. Truth is something to evolve toward. Truth is very much needed in the cooperative movement. So I want you to know as I go forward with this, that while I am be going to be grounded in fundamental truths, about white led co ops, the links to societally based white supremacy, and what we can do about that. I am grounded as I speak with you in love and respect, and I honor where you are coming from and the work that you are doing in this movement. I am saying, however, that we can do more and we can do better. Next slide. And we can do it all together. Next slide. This is some of the things, these are some of the things I'm going to talk about, some less, some more. Uh, some history, our current systems and lifestyles are built using past systems and lifestyles. Those past systems were built to advantage whiteness and they continue to do so. Current affairs, America was only great for white people and only some of them. <laughs> that means that white Americans have only framed their questions and challenges, including cooperative ones, around their own experiences. The two examples, hair and farming justice, I know, hair, what? <laughs> we have had states in the last few years actually pass laws to say that you cannot discriminate against people based on how hair grows in their head. The ludicrousness of that should impact all of us, but it is based on beauty standards and professional, stand, professional work standards that said that African-American hair needed to be tamed to look like white hair in order to be seen as proper, appropriate, professional. And often you don't get hired if you don't have that kind of hair. I encourage you to Google what it takes for African-Americans to have hair that grows in their heads as it is in order to look the way hair looks on white people's heads. It's an expensive process and it's a literally toxic process. In fact, there are class action lawsuits out there right now. 
farming justice. When Biden became president, he tried to do a reparation style bill that forgave black farmers for their loans based on a century plus of discrimination, clear outright discrimination. 12 white farmers were recruited by a conservative law firm to sue based on quote unquote reverse discrimination. They weren't eligible for the monies for the forgiveness because they were white. Well, color me, duh, the judge who allowed that to go through, which halted all of the for loan forgiveness, did so in spite of the obviousness of why that new program was necessary because the only lens he could look through was a lens based on white rationales, white logic, white reasoning that said, well, yes, of, of course he's being they're being discriminated against. But none of that allows for the truth that what was actually happening was a program was instituted in order to make up for how those white farmers, many of which didn't require loan forgiveness, achieved their land ownership in the first place and the monies, the loan monies that they got over the years uh, by discriminating against black and other people of color. Uh, economics of good, good nutrition versus POCRL, people of color, real life. What are the roadblocks to accessing good nutrition? This is important because without good nutrition, we can't have good health. And without good health, we can't have good energy, which means we don't have great brain power in order to accomplish or even dream, imagine the things that are possible. Uh, so what are the roadblocks to that in terms of white power, white influence, white supremacy, and how does that connect to white-led food co-ops? Last, farmers, farming, food production in white and black, and none of it is an accident. Um, most of this on the final page, next to final page, there is a, it's a links page and there are several links. I strongly encourage you all uh, to look up those links in your uh, <laughs> supposed downtime uh, and uh, read up on this information because it is all so very important if you want to do this work. And I'm going to simply assume that since you're here in this workshop with me speaking to you about what I teach on, then you're serious about both the curiosity and the desire to do more. Uh, please do your reading. Next slide, please. The Star Spangled Banner, we know all that hullabaloo that got going uh, before, because folks uh, refused to stand, refused to put their hand over their chest and then started to kneel, despite the fact that he actually kneeled because a veteran asked him to compromise and that was the compromise they struck. Uh, so rather than disrespecting the flag and veterans, he was actually trying to respect it. Uh, um, but never mind that for now. The Star Spangled Banner, written by Francis Scott Key. What you have before you is the third stanza of the Star Spangled Banner. The part in particular of this third stanza, which is never sung, of course, their blood has washed out their foul footsteps pollution. No refuge could save the hireling and slave from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave. And the Star Spangled Banner in triumph doth wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Next slide, please. Uh, a quote from Neighboring Food Co-op Association. I also put the link to this on the links page. To live out and fulfill the values and principles of our cooperative movement, we need to center 
social, racial, and economic justice in our co-ops by understanding the diverse history of cooperative organizing both nationally and globally, we will be more effective in our work to create a more just and inclusive economy and society. Clearly I made a mistake there. <laughs> Neighboring Food Co-op Association. Next slide, please. And I, I'm sorry, can you go back for a second? Can you go back to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Uh, no, no, the next one, one after that. The NFCA quote. There, thank you. Um, I wanna say here that NFCA and uh, I'm gonna name Bonnie Hudspeth because I've, I've worked the most with her um, in that organization. Uh, this is an organization that positions itself as a white-led organization, but is a white-led ally organization. They do wonderful work centering equity and justice, particularly where race is concerned, and they do not shy away uh, from that work. Is there more that they can do? Uh, of course, but it is a small organization, a small staff, and what they do do with that size is so much more than so many others, including most of the cooperative movement. Next slide. Thank you. This is a quote by James Baldwin in The Fire Next Time. Love takes off the masks that we wear, that we fear we cannot live without and we know we cannot live within. I use the word love here, not merely in the personal sense, but as a state of being or a state of grace, not in the infantile American sense of being made happy, but in the tough and universal sense of quest and daring and growth. I think you'll find that I did use a lot of quotes, uh, but they are important in, in making sure that the message is not just centered, but grounded as I go on. Next slide, please. Doesn't that just look marvelous? Now, what you should know is that I didn't just put that because it just looks delicious. Do you see the diversity there? The diversity in our food, diversity in nature. The only place where diversity goes missing is with human beings. We separate. We separate by education, we separate by housing, we separate at work, we separate even in recipes, we separate in faith. And we're gonna have to do better than that. Next slide, please. Epigenetics. Uh, I wanna do a trigger alert here because we're gonna be talking about trauma, uh, uh, not all of the trauma that this actually talks about, but I wanna make sure in case anyone um, uh, has issues. So epigenetics. So what exactly are these epigenetic studies? Epigenetics is differences among groups who had gone through extreme physical and psychological stress like Holocaust survivors, those who were born to parents who lived through the Dutch hunger winter, and sons of Confederate prisoner of war soldiers in the American Civil War all make the case the most clearly, but they're not the whole picture. There has also been a lot of work in the lab focused on this phenomenon. And that work really accelerated after the Human Genome Project, HDP, was completed in 2003. Uh, here's a look at what scientists have learned from both case studies and experiments. Uh, see article and author attribution on link slide at end of presentation. Um, what's important here is that I want to point out two things. Uh, the first is that what epigenetics is talking about in these cases is that when someone experiences a trauma, particularly severe traumas like this as extreme physical and psychological stress, 
that stress leaves, that experience leaves markers on the genes and the cells and they ex can express themselves in later generations. So those experiences not only don't just fade away in the individual who experienced them, but they get passed down through the generations. The uh, second thing I wanna point out here is actually the doctor who was explaining this, who was talking about this, the examples that he used, Holocaust survivors, uh, Dutch hunger winter survivors, and sons of Confederate prisoner, prisoner of war soldiers in the American Civil War. Now, I've looked this up in several other places as well. Do you know, no one who is talking about this uses slavery, American slavery, as an example of extreme physical and psychological stress. They've named Holocaust survivors, the survivors of the Dutch hunger winter, prisoner of war soldiers uh, from the American Civil War, Confederate prisoner of war soldiers in the American Civil War. And there are papers that discuss the victims and survivors of rape. No one talks about slavery and how that might have impacted not only, I mean, if this is true, if this, and it is true, they've proven it. It's, it's, if this is true of Holocaust survivors, of Confederate prisoner of war soldiers in the American Civil War, if you know anything about slavery and what happened in slavery, how much more true might it be of that group and all of us who came after them? But the real point I wanna make about this is something that may very well blow your mind. You may never have heard of it before. I don't know, I'm gonna say it here. For some reason in white culture, uh, whether it's supremacy or just regular everyday uh, kind of white goings on. Whites don't seem to think of themselves as a race. It's whites and then it's races. White people are one of the races. And the experience, experiences of white Americans, even before they were Americans, uh, during slavery would have impacted white people as it impacted black people. The exact same way? Well, no, of course not. But you can't do the kinds of things that happened then. You can't create the systems that were created by our founding fathers. You can't continue those systems and not address them. And in fact, we're going backwards now, right? Banning books and systems and conversations and firing teachers for daring to wanna to teach truth. Logically to me, white Americans have been impacted epigenetically by everything that went past. Think of it as a universal consciousness, however you wanna think about it. White Americans would not have escaped being impacted. If you need an example of that, think about white rage. Think about uh, the, the incident in Ohio where a teenage uh, white female wanted to join uh, the movement for Black Lives Matter because she thought it was just and she wanted to hold up her own sign. And primarily white men who were there 
she was marching on her own side of the street because no one would let her cross to the other side. And when she held it up, she was hassled, harassed, and eventually physically, physically touched, attacked by mostly white, grown white men and some women who tried to rip the sign out of her hands, eventually did rip it out and tore it up. And just as the video cuts away, uh, you see one go from shaking her to actually shoving her. And by the way, the police authorities were there and did nothing to protect her. Uh, so I'm next slide, please. These are the seven principles. I'm trying, I'm sorry, I think I reversed some slides. I, I thought this one was later, but uh, I want us to pay attention to how these principles are being betrayed in the cooperative movement, particularly in my experience in the American cooperative movement. Uh, we are not particularly an open and voluntary membership, except in the sense that everyone who can come uh, could join if they have the money uh, if they know about the co-op, if they're being recruited and, and being invited into a welcoming space, uh, democratic member control, there's nothing democratic uh, about excluding people. There's nothing democratic about not being willing to hear everybody's voice or about shutting people down if they start to talk about stuff that you don't wanna be bothered with. Autonomy and independence, again, if you're shutting people down and stopping them from talking and being able to, to help voice a message, then that's not happening. Education, training, and information, oh, please God. That is so not happening. Uh, we're functioning, functioning much more based on the bottom line, uh, which is in too many cases, money. Real education, real training, real information about what it is to cooperate, what cooperation means, uh, that cooperation is about equity, inclusion. It's about justice at its most fundamental level. Cooperation is about justice. It's about safety. It's about coming together to achieve something, whether it's safety or, or sharing of food, or artisans coming together so that they can get fair prices for what they create. But we have not been owning our responsibility when it comes to education, training, and information. Cooperation among cooperatives. White-led co-ops rarely reach out to co-ops led by people of color to ask them how they can help what they can do. Can I help you with money, with product, with marketing? Uh, can I give you some advice? Can you give us some advice on what we're doing and how we can do better, be better? Concern for community. When it says concern for community, it is not only talking about your immediate community, but let's say that it was. What have you done? What have white-led co-ops done for their immediate communities? that bring the message of racial equity and justice home to its community members, to its co-op members. What have they done to ask if their community can help them in doing that work? Concern for community, the larger community. What have co excuse me, what have co-ops been doing to educate the rest of this nation about why co-ops are so important, why the work, we've been so busy running these food co-ops as regular grocery stores and paying attention to the bottom line that we have forgotten why co-ops need to exist and spreading the word and doing the work. Next slide, please. 
whiteness and the seven club. See, that's what I switched. <laughs> whiteness and the seven cooperative principles, a new lens. These are some bullet points, things that I think people need, uh, particularly folks at white led co-ops need to pay attention to, but it's important for anyone, particularly in the cooperative field. Time spent on how to address food access issues. This is real, it is ongoing, and it is urgent. It's time to ask some questions and challenge yourselves on what is happening, what you are, are giving to the movement and your own co-op in terms of this and how you're challenging yourself to think differently and inviting others in to challenge you as well. Time spent actively recruiting people of color. I know, I know, but there are no people of color in my community. What am I supposed to do? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to ask yourself why there aren't any people of color in your community. Why there aren't any people of color in your membership. Why you haven't asked yourself that question before. Time spent defining democracy for all. Democracy is a fairly new concept for the Western world. And when I'm talking Western world, I'm really talking about modern Western world. So uh, Europe, well, England, Great Britain, Australia, America. This notion of democracy, first of all, we all say it as a word. We talk about it as one of our principles. I dare you to start asking people in your co-op, on the board, in management, staff, members, what does democracy mean for you? How do you define democracy? What does democracy look like to you? Time spent partnering with POC-led food co-ops. I talked to you about that already. Time ensuring welcoming spaces for all. I don't want to hear any more talk, particularly from white-led co-ops, about how welcoming we are. That's BS. If you were that welcoming, then a lot more people would want to be a part of what you're doing. We wouldn't still have people talking about hippy-dippy food co-ops. We wouldn't still have people thinking of food co-ops as elitist. And if they're saying elitist, you can believe they mean white. I don't think that while there are black elites, I don't remember anyone talking about how they couldn't come into a black elite food co-op. Next slide, please. These are the links. Uh, for you guys, I know that you're going to be your, um, this is going to, this presentation, including the slide is going to be shared with you. Please look these up, use them. It's really, really important that we grow, that we evolve. And please know this, know this because it is an absolute and there aren't that many out there. Evolution doesn't happen unless there are stressors. Evolution does not happen without challenge. So being challenged, experiencing stress is not a bad thing. How we respond to them is what defines who we are, what we get done, and whether or not we are truly cooperating. There is so, so very much that we can do. So very much. And keeping ourselves separate, not doing the work, not asking the questions, not being willing to challenge ourselves, thinking that we're woke when we are not, thinking that we are allies when we are not. Feeling exhausted. You're not exhausted. People of color are exhausted. 
because we're fighting battles every single day. Next slide, please. I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with what happened in Buffalo, New York, when a young white man uh, went into a Topps grocery store in a black community and opened fire, killing, if I remember correctly, it was 10 people and wounding many more. This is a quote from Judge Susan, Susan Egan on the day she was sentencing him. However, white supremacy is not inevitable or unstoppable. It has been carefully cultivated and nurtured by individuals and the government for centuries. This is the history that we have all inherited. It has been passed down from generation to generation. We must acknowledge that history, see that history for what it is, recognize it and learn from it, or we are doomed to repeat it. Let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better, we must do better. Our own humanity requires it. Let ours be the generation to put a stop to it. We can do better, we must do better. She said this before sentencing, these are my words, before sentencing the hate-driven murderer to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Judge Susan Egan is a white woman who gets it. I want us as cooperators to get it, to do the work, to do the work of becoming one beloved community, to care enough to challenge ourselves to do the work. We're cooperatives. It's essential that we live that creed. Next slide. That's your last slide. Huh. One of the slides is missing. Oh, sorry, it's not there. That's okay, that's okay, not your fault. No, it's not there. Not your fault. I did something. Um, I'll make sure everybody has it. Oh, there you go. There it is. I accidentally skipped it. The wrong place. It. There you go. I would like you guys to remember this, pass it on. Uh, if you need this work, I am here for you. There's lots of work to be done. Um, uh, the tagline for Black Label Consulting and Coaching is where wellness sees justice. Justice is important, it is essential, but we get that way by practicing wellness, by making sure that we are healthy people, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, healthy individuals. Thank you very much for attending the workshop. Thank you, Stuart. Back to you, JQ. Did you want uh, to move into Q&A discussion? Uh, I am happy to entertain questions. Who has questions? Or thoughts that arose oh, while you were reading I this? I see your faces now. Isn't that nice? <laughs> <laughs> Who is the cityscape? Dina. I don't want to move back to Los Angeles, but I miss cityscapes. <laughs> <laughs> we met we met um at the conference last year i was i had the pleasure of being in one of your workshops so i go by free so it's, it was great okay. to be here this evening again to hear your wonderful presentation thank well, you thank you so much i appreciate hearing that tell the truth i always appreciate hearing stuff like that because bring it on 
<laughs> I always do. So does anybody have any um, questions for me? I will so answer you know that anything. This, I was curious about like, uh, well, I have a question, but I was too simple question and a, and a mm -hmm. other longer question. This, um, what was um, Black Label Consulting? I was wondering if it was um, supported by a, a co-op or something like that. Um, I just thought right. to ask that. And then Black I had a question Label about Black Label Consulting Marvis. and Coaching is my company. I support co-ops rather than the other way around. So for instance, uh, when a co-op hires me um, for retreat facilitation, something like that, right? They have some strategic planning or something. Um, I do that for all manner of organizations, but for co-ops, they get a discount. If they are a Black-led co-op, they get a significant discount. Um, so I support co-ops and co-ops support me by hiring me to help them. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. yeah, I do mm -hmm. similar kind of work. Um, oh, but um, but not so. Um, I had never considered deliberately supporting the co-ops um, <laughs> with that work, but that's a good idea. Hey, yeah. wellness, like it just seemed like that word caught you, and I was wondering what you were thinking. I am a person who has started. Well, I started a long time ago, uh, but I was undisciplined. <laughs> um, using food and nutrition, uh, both the, the science and the old school, because my big mama, for those of you who don't know, there's a lot of folks who started in the South who called their grandparents big mama and big daddy. <laughs> my mother's mother and father were big mama and big daddy. Uh, big mama on my mother's side and grandma on my daddy's side uh, knew so many old home remedies for different things. Most of them worked. Some of them were a little shady, like the horseradish to cure my asthma. <laughs> um, uh, and I grew up with a mother uh, who didn't like a lot of processed stuff uh, mm -hmm. in the house. And it was only many years later as, a, as an adult that I figured out what she was doing because I, of course, moved out of the house and ate a lot of processed stuff. Uh, my asthma was so much worse, <laughs> so much worse. And as I've come to it, I am, I am mostly, I am primarily plant-based and my asthma has improved by leaps and bounds. I take uh, considerably less medicine than I used to. And it occurs to me that with the stress of what we deal with as black people, as American citizens, as human beings, uh, and the kids that I used to work with who couldn't function well in school, the poorer you are, the less really good nutrition you get. Um, so wellness is essential. Massages are not luxury items. Acupuncture, not a luxury item. Uh, eating really good, healthy, fresh foods, not luxury items. Mm -hmm. So wellness is an essential part of the work that I do now. Um, uh, and it's, it, it should be a part of the cooperative. Can you imagine being a part of a food co-op and not pushing that message? Mm -hmm. Just saying, <laughs> Siobhan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to Siobhan and then we have Audrey in the in the chat after Siobhan. Okay, Siobhan. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to know if you could drop a link um, to contact you for services because we're looking for a strategic planner for our co-op. Let me guess. I once again did a contact sheet and forgot my email address, didn't I? I think it might have been on the slide, but I'm going to go grab your contact info and drop it. So don't worry about it. You can tune the combo. Thank I'll you. go get it and get the chat. <laughs> I will make, you will, you will have that contact information, Siobhan. Thank you for asking. Thank you. <laughs> you would, you would think, I know I left my phone number there, but I, I left off the, the email, which is 
important since I really hate answering my phone. <laughs> I ask people to text me instead of call me. Um, what uh, what co-op are you a part of? I'm um, sorry, I meant to say that. Um, Kingston Food Co-op. Oh, okay. Uh, have you been contacted by someone from us? From uh, well, I just know a lot of people in a lot of places and you know, I'm just, <laughs> I hear the news. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but I would like to talk to uh, you and others there about uh, the process you're going through. Yeah, would that would be lovely. So I'll look for. Oh, I think she, Jake, you put it. Okay, great. So I'll okay, save that so, and we'll reach out to you. Okay, and one other thing um, before we go on to the next, uh, it is Black Label Consultant and Coaching. That is what, what my business license is under. You guys should know that I am actually changing the name uh, of the business and sort of not rebranding it, but sort of redirecting it. It's going to be called the Beloved Community Consulting and Coaching. Um, I'm, I'm pivoting to something that is less capitalistic sounding and feeling mm -hmm. and more and closer to who I am as a human being and who I was raised to be. Uh, so who was the next person? Um, Audrey, so much and, Audrey, do you want to unmute or you want me to read it for you? I can read it. Okay. Um, Hi, Audrey. Yeah. Hi. Um, I really appreciate at the end the list of like a new lens and talking about addressing food access issues and democracy and creating a welcoming space. Um, and that's just a couple of the things that you listed there. But I was wondering if you've seen any specific co-ops like kind of course correct or work on becoming more welcoming and equitable spaces and any specific steps that they took to do that. White led co-op food co-op? Yes. Yes. No. No. Okay. To be brief. But let me let me say this. There are a lot of white led food co-ops that talk about it and that say it's important. And I want to be as fair as I can be. I believe that they believe it is important to them. I believe that they believe that. But as human beings, and I'm gonna get into the whole psychology thing here. As human beings, we often, we frequently fool ourselves about what we know, what we believe, what we like, what we want to do. More often than not, we say those things and then we immediately step back into, oh, I'm so tired. I'm exhausted. My plate is full. I've got this to do. Okay. Look, I have a family. I have life. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and when it comes to white Americans, the issue is so much deeper than that because privilege and supremacy, the way everything was designed, what every white person in America has grown up on, as well as the rest of us, has made it so that white Americans don't need to see anything else except what conveniences them. And so it's very easy, as one board member at Green Star said to me once, um, Green Star Co-op here in Ithaca, uh, we were talking about diversity initiatives. And he said, well, you know what? We have all this other really important stuff to do. Maybe we can get to that when we have time. The first mistake was saying something as stupid as that to me. The second part is it was just a mistake period <laughs> to say it at all, but that's the thinking. And, and he wasn't trying to be racist. He wasn't trying to be mean or cruel or anything like that. Whiteness privileges that kind of thinking. It encourages, welcomes, advantages that kind of thinking. So without a deliberateness, without going back to your co-op and going, needs to change, time is now. Or as I say to people, including on Facebook, hashtag time's up. 
there's work to be done. So I welcome you to give me a call or text me <laughs> or email me and we can have a dialogue about that and maybe think of ways to help the co-op. Um, but I have to tell you, I no longer deal in uh, fruitless conversations. Uh, so if they're not serious, as soon as I divine that, I will be looking for other directions, other places. Um, but I'm here for you if you want me. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, I'm sorry. Did someone else have their hand up? I don't know. Uh, yeah. I don't um, think so. Go to GE and then Stuart after that. Oh, okay. go ahead, Stuart. I'm sorry. I went already. Go ahead, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I usually should be. Um, <laughs> it's I just, been a while, Stuart. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Um, hey, I just wondered what you thought about work that Seward Co-op did when you said that you hadn't seen a white co-op that had really done meaningful work in, in becoming more welcoming. Um, That's not quite what I said. Well, I no, I, I'm just. But go ahead, go no, ahead. No, no, no. I don't mean to misrepresent your words, but uh, as far as a co-op that had done meaningful work to become more welcome to people of color, and and to include the, their voices and their presence in the co-op, they did some pretty significant work. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, you, I just wondered if define, you, define okay. significant work for me. Give me examples. They were able, when they opened their second store, they hired from within the community and increased mm -hmm. the percentage of people of color working at both of their stores to near the levels of community representation and hired a black manager for their new store who is now the manager, the overall CEO of the of Seward. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that might be an, I mean, it may not be a perfect example. There's never a perfect one. Well, let me let me say this so that because sometimes it's it's really important to as a writer, I'm I'm very careful with the words and how how I use them. So yeah. have they made changes? Yes. Yeah. Have they done good work? Yes. Have they done anything that for me is significant work, significant change? And my answer remains no. Okay. Hiring a, a black GM who becomes uh, the overall manager of the organization may very well be a significant move. I would have to see what happens in the future, right? right. Because I'm fairly certain that that black manager is gonna face resistance uh, uh, as time goes on, uh, because people in general don't like change. White people really don't like change. Not if it means exhausting their, uh, em not if it means evoking their emotional exhaustion, uh, the spirit of exhaustion, um, because most white Americans don't even know their own history. They just don't. And if you and if you don't know that history, like the white people who go on tours of plantations in the South and then get pissed off and write complaints about they didn't go there to hear about slavery, <laughs> they went there to see the beauty of the plantations. I mean, come on. <laughs> so I haven't seen what I would consider to be significant. When I start seeing something significant, it's going to look like justice is is coming. Okay, um, that's what is significant to me. Uh, but we could—I would love to talk with you about that because maybe maybe there's a place that something that I have missed. Or it, it, it could be any number of things. I don't have a problem with being challenged or even saying my bad, um, yeah. but I, 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 I rarely do. Yeah, 
I don't it, intend to challenge you. I, I'm just curious because it's one of the more significant efforts. And it has been, um, their story has been told a few in a few different places. Well, yes, of course. Yeah. Because in most other co-ops, nothing yeah. is happening. Well, right. But to so me, that's significant. To me, it may it's not be as, <laughs> yeah, it's significant. It might be as significant as we'd like. It's comparatively significant, and okay. that's an important qualifier. That's it good. Is comparatively significant. Okay. Um, anyone? Move, move on. <laughs> I, thought, oh, I do see a hand up. Yep. Yeah. Just to just to respond to Stuart and and your exchange is very interesting. I was thinking that, so it's, I'm glad he asked that question. And um, I don't know how to say it. But I'm thinking that, yeah, both of you are right. And, um, you know, as a consultant for the co-op where I'm working right now, I'm a consultant um, working on a large grant with them. I've been with them for three years. And and I'm also board develop. I do board development for them. Yeah. So I'm rebuilding their co-op. I had often said that um, one of my favorite, and it's in a white town, right across the mason dixon line but there are black um citizens in the community mm -hmm. and very few members of the co-op of course but i often said that shitty towns are full of shitty people and um, that was for the first year that was the 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 way that i approached the organizing mm -hmm. how i gathered them i obviously wouldn't gather very many of them but that was you know i guess only the strong survived and they <laughs> This is thing stuck with me, but it just never got very comfortable, right? right. And, it, and and I think that's what you're saying, and um, I, I appreciate that. But I also hear what Stuart's saying too that the idea to hire a black consultant to lead their organization and to develop their board is a significant move for them. But maybe it's two different problems being discussed right. here. And I think that you laid out a really interesting point through the earlier in the present, actually throughout the whole presentation, you were talking about how the ex the daily experience of being a Black person didn't match the daily experience of being a non-Black person. Right. And, and, and like they're two different worlds, we like to say, you know. So they, they are in, in many ways too entirely uh, different worlds. And again, let me point out that when the doctor was talking about explaining epigenetics, when he was explaining epigenetics, uh, <laughs> it was almost like he, he was doing this and zigzagging to do anything except talk about uh, slavery because you can't list those other things yeah. as epigenetically important and not think of something as huge as the institution of American slavery, particularly when I know South, um, South Africa mm -hmm. and Nazi Germany both looked to American slavery to frame their systems. You know, you, it seems mind boggling unless you know and understand what actually went down during slavery and how looking at that and looking at where we are now means it didn't happen. I'm sorry. You're okay, we can keep talking. I just need to wrap the official session okay. up. Everyone who wants to keep chatting, please stay. <laughs> but first, I don't <laughs> want to miss taking the opportunity to say thank you to Patrice for once again and coming and sharing her expertise, her knowledge or wisdom with all of us. Um, so I just wanted to give a shout out to her and I will be sending out a PDF of the slides because there were those great links and I think a lot of you wanted to capture those. So I'll send that separately from the video so you can more easily capture those links from thank her. You, okay? Thank you, And again, <laughs> I wanna say to you guys, uh, if you can get to Up and Coming, uh, which is live this year, I will be there uh, with a uh, sort of similar. <laughs> presentation, but a major difference is that there will be breakout sessions so that you can really talk about what you know and what you're feeling and not only listen uh, to me talk. 
so for those of you who are gonna make it, I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for being here uh, at my workshop. I always enjoy uh, speaking to you guys and the Q and A's afterwards. Um, we rock. And thank you, thank you, thank you, JQ. You are as always awesome. <laughs> Well, as all, I, oh, I, I take, I take a that as a deep compliment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, I just um, want to remind those of us who are going to be continuing with the series of what's coming up. We've got two more sessions tomorrow, uh, and then we jump to next week. Next week's sessions are much denser. We got a lot more of them. This was, but uh, we got it nice and warmed up this week. We're going to do two things on governance tomorrow. So we're geeking out on governance. But we're talking about the system of policy governance and what it is, how you utilize it as a startup board. It's going to be a really nice basic introduction that will not be dry uh, with Joel Kapischke from Seven Roots, if you want to check that out. And then systems of document repositories. Ma'am, that doesn't sound super exciting, right? But this is actually a topic that you guys requested. Uh, and we're going to talk to two uh, board, pres the past board presidents and the current board president of Chicago Market, um, who have been very successful in creating really good systems of keeping all the board information and this and all the different things that move through volunteers and everything so they can make their startup more successful and they're going to share with you what they've come up with and then next week we'll be coming back um, and I'll be doing a presentation on the use of visual timelines and how you can create a visual timeline of the process of creating your co-op that is meaningful that will actually get uh, help your owners understand and your community understand what needs to be done and how it's going to happen and last but not least I can't not say the series would not be possible without our sponsors uh, for this round of FCI Live for summer 2023, and we are so grateful to them. Thank you all for being here, and I'm now going to stop the recording. <laughs>